You're listening to Trek FM. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. There was a little bar in Mill Valley where all the Starfleet trainees used to go. The 602 Club. You know it. <laughs> I was there more times than I can remember. Welcome everyone to Trek FM's local watering hole. I am so excited to be here. I would tell you where we are, but then I'd probably have to kill you. So uh, I'm so excited that uh, to be back in the 602 Club, though. Um, I just can't tell you which room we're in. Psst. Hey, Matt. The eagle What's up, has Alice? landed. The eagle has landed. Oh, good. That means our drinks are here. Awesome. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Well, as everybody can tell, Alice is back here with me in the 602 Club, and we're really excited to come at you tonight uh, from a secret location. Only Ruby knows where we are. But uh, before we dive into our topic, just make sure you check everything out 602 Club-wise all over the place. Um, We're with uh, Trek FM on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. We get emails at trek.fm slash contact. So just go there, choose a show, choose the 602 Club, and that will come straight to me. Of course, we love to get voicemails from people. So go to speakpipe.com slash trek.fm and you can leave us a voicemail, which is a lot of fun. The listeners only discussion group is a great place to have a conversation with everybody who's listening to Trek FM. Go to the Babel conference, type Babel into the search field on Facebook. Or if you're at our website, trek.fm click discussion on any of the mini bars and it'll bring you there and of course we're on itunes which is great we're a feature provider there with trek fm and of course we're doing the review contest right now we've only got a few days left for that so get your review in and you could win a copy of batman v superman ultimate edition digitally i'm excited to give that one away and i really appreciate everybody who's gone in and given some reviews already it's been great so really appreciate that and i would love to give that away but um Alice, uh, this is going to be really interesting because we've never gotten a chance to talk about this series before, and it's one of those series that's been going on for a while. I know, almost 20 they, years, right? Yeah, it seems it's like crazy. a- It's crazy. It's insane. Um, and we're talking about the Bourne, I can't say trilogy anymore. It's it's the Bourne whatever five is. Yeah, it's not know. a sex- sectology because that would be six uh i i don't know what a what what five is so somebody will tell me um yeah i hey send a send a voicemail with that info (laughs) there you go what a five uh lineup is but this is this is one of those movies it's like we keep getting sequels every once in a while the last one didn't even have matt damon in it but uh this one jason Bourne, as it's called uh brings back Paul Greengrass and Matt Damon back together to give us more born action. So, before we dove into that, though, I thought, well, we've never covered this before. Nobody knows where we're coming from on it. So, I thought we kind of remember some of those identities, those past identities that he's had, uh, and our films, and just <laughs> kind of wanted you to run through the previous films and kind of what your thoughts on the series were, especially as we come into the fact that we got Jason Bourne, you know, just a week ago. Right. Um, so I, I enjoy the spy genre quite a bit uh, and went through a stage in my uh, late middle school, early high school years where I read a lot of spy novels, the Jason Bourne uh, novels being, uh, not all of them, but being some of the ones that I read. So I was familiar with the characters even before the movies came out. Uh, and, you know, that first film, and then Supremacy even more so, uh, w- were kind of a breath of fresh air um, into the genre. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the first three films, uh, the trilogy, uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I, as, as usual for me, they went, you know, enjoyed the first one the most, then the second one. <laughs> the third one but I did enjoy all three of them uh quite a bit and I didn't hate the Bourne legacy even you know the one that has Hawkeye in it <laughs> um yeah Jeremy Renner getting some action yeah. <laughs> with Rachel Wise <laughs> and I you know I liked what they did with the story and legacy and and gave a little bit of the science uh 
I enjoyed his co-star who 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 that was now has just immediately of course left my head talking about Rachel it. Weiss. Yeah, I mean I really enjoyed their energy and dynamic. I enjoyed her performance as much as his and that's one of the films where the, the female character was almost you know, it was almost a, a buddy movie, you know, she was almost as important as the boring character. Um, so, I mean, overall, I have really enjoyed uh, the series a lot. Yeah, I, I think um, I'm with you. You know, this was, I remember seeing the original Born, Born Identity. And, you know, I'm not talking about the Richard Chamberlain version <laughs> they did way back in the day. I have seen uh, that. <laughs> yeah, I am talking about uh, the one with Matt Damon. And I remember really liking it. As you said, it was kind of a breath of fresh air to the spy genre. I think... The problem was is that, you know, uh, at that point, the Bond movies, we were getting like Die Another Day, where it was just so ridiculous that you threw up a little bit in your mouth when you watched it. And, uh, you know, this was so grounded and felt very realistic. And, you know, it was the action was brutal, but we had a kind of compelling story and a compelling character, especially that first movie. I, I give it a lot of props for really using, I think, the storyline itself to its fullest advantage, um, discovering who this character is along with the character himself. And that's that's always a really interesting ride if you do it well. And luckily, uh, Doug Lyman, who was the director then, and Matt Damon really pull it off. And so, of course, then we got uh, Born Supremacy. I do think that that's probably my favorite in the series. Uh, I think it's a really good film. They took that and they were able to raise the stakes and continue to, you know, introduce you to the character and help him find out more about himself. And then Born Ultimatum, while I don't think is half as good a film as the other two, I think does a great job of completing the trilogy mm. for Born. It, 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 does, it does a nice job of wrapping up the bow and I think hitting on the head very much the thematic element that especially Greengrass and I think Matt Damon really added uh, as a commentary on the world and mm. you know our reactions after 9-11 and it wasn't necessarily so much about calling people out but more about just saying we are responsible for our actions we got ourselves where we are we made the choice it's on us each individually and I think that was a very strong message really well done and of course you know we got to legacy I didn't hate legacy I just don't think it holds a candle to especially the first two Bourne movies and so yeah we get to Jason Bourne and I remember <laughs> I saw the preview for the first one I was like it it was Saturday Night Live classic really <laughs> really you know that was really my first reaction like I I'm thinking I I kind of do feel like this story has had run its, its bow, run its course, so to speak. Right, in, right. You know, I, you know, it, we've so that's just kind of where I was coming into the film, and and just really honestly, I I, I wasn't I wasn't like I was really looking forward to this one, but I kind of wanted to see where they'd go, and I hoped, and as I do with every movie, I was like, I just hope this is really good. I, I hope that they don't. And this is what happens where with every sequel, even on a TV show where they keep doing millions of seasons, will each successive season and or movie ruin what's come before. So you're like, just don't do that. We'll be OK. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have a, I didn't I hadn't seen uh, I, I, I hadn't seen even a preview before I walked into the movie theater. So I really had no expectations. I didn't know what the storyline was or anything so I went in completely blind. I had no idea what to expect. I had no idea what they were going to do. Well, and honestly, I think that there were only a couple of trailers that I saw, and they don't give much away. I mean, other than the fact that Bourne is kind of resurfaced and <laughs> that Nikki was going to be back, right? Uh, you know, the J uh, Julia Stiles character, and that um, Tommy Lee Jones is going to be in there and Alicia Vivikander. So those are really the only things I got. As to what the actual story was going to be, I had no idea. So, I mean, that's good. I wasn't ruined going in. That's always the worst when yeah. you walk into a movie and then you realize, oh, I've seen all of this on TV and it was free. <laughs> Truth. So, I guess 
kind of talking through that, it gives it leads us to this kind of idea of being reborn. Born is being reborn, being brought back to, uh, you know, the the movie studio. Now it's brought back to uh, the theater, and we're sitting in there. And I kind of wanted to just kind of talk to you and through everything about how they bring this character back and why they bring this character back with the story. What do you think about the reasons that we kind of bring this character out of mothballs? It's 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 a little bit hard because I really feel like they didn't go hmm far enough or in a different enough direction. I'm not sure how to word it. You know, with him coming back and still struggling with his past uh even though i think in the in the you know thing it's like i remember it all and what does nikki say something like uh even just because you know it doesn't mean you understand it or something like that yeah something cryptic like that it's even spy language it makes you sound smart but are you really smart i don't know <laughs> i don't know um and i it, for me the it, it's actually the depth and interest of the story that was actually the weakest part of the film for me i just don't think they went far enough deep enough explored the character motivations quite enough you know it it was a perfectly great action movie i didn't regret having gone to see it um but it, it just wasn't as compelling i wasn't as interested i mean one of the reasons why i love spy novels and and mysteries in the same ilk is because i like to solve puzzles I, I love to solve puzzles and this wasn't a very compelling problem to solve or a puzzle to solve so in that vein it really did kind of fall a little bit flat for me i think you have a really great point there isn't a lot of puzzling going on i, I think I, I feel like you're right in the sense that every point in the story seems so choreographed like uh, and 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 the moment you start to see where they're going to go with Born and how they're going to change his story that you had wrapped up in the trilogy, I think that's where things start to come off the rails because the the theme for Born of uh, that he did this, it was his choice. Right, he, he volunteered. Made the choice. He volunteered. It's his fault. It, he has to take personal responsibility for it. Huge, great. I mean, what a fantastic, it's still an incredible theme, especially in today's world where everybody wants to just pass the buck. It's not my fault, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, but here, the storyline allows him to be able to do that. It's not his fault, really. He was manipulated into it. And that completely changes the theme that I think Greengrass and Matt Damon had set up originally especially with that trilogy and i think that harms their message because now we're just passing the buck instead of saying uh, no as people and as a nation we have to look at ourselves and say no we're responsible yeah it's interesting that you said it because i i i guess in my own perception of that question uh, i would say he you still have a choice Right. He still has a choice to seek revenge or not seek revenge, regardless of whether this horrible thing has happened to you in your life. You still have to make it. I mean, that's what I tell my son. It's perfectly okay to have emotions. It's perfectly okay to be angry and upset. But in the end, what's important is what you decide to do with that emotion or do because you have that emotion. So even though he's been manipulated into volunteering because he thinks his dad has been killed by terrorists, he still made that choice. You know what I mean? Um, no, I, I completely know what you mean. And I, I think the only thing that it does is just it weakens it mm. because it it makes it more palatable for us to be able to say, oh, well, he's doing it for these. Re- okay, well, I might not love what he's doing or who he became, but at least I get it. Right. Um, and, you know, you, you kind of take away the sting, I think, which is, I did this just because I'm reacting to what happened in the world and I make the choice to become this. Like, I make myself this. And this one, he's he's still making some decisions, but a lot of those decisions are, are being fomented for him specifically, psychologically, to to make him want to choose it in a way that it wasn't before. So, yeah... I, I think you're exactly right. He still has the choice. 
and and that's not a huge problem. I think it just hurts to me when I'm watching now the other three movies. Mm. You know, the I, I'd say that that trilogy specifically, um, you know, it was wrapped up in a nice bow and it was a poignant one and it was a little bit painful uh, oh. for anyone to watch when you start to think about personal responsibility, who I choose to be, all of that kind of stuff. I volunteered, you know. Um, that's a much different thing than to say, well, I volunteered because my dad was, you know, like, He's volunteering because of nine eleven. I mean, I can, I can, I can totally see where you're you're coming from. I guess I didn't have as big of an attachment to that aspect of the storyline as you did, so it wasn't as big of a blow, I guess, for for me. But I can, I can see where if you know, if for you that did represent that nineties package, you're like, darn it, it did go back and kind of ruin <laughs> the earlier films for me. <laughs> darn it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's that's great though that you know we're 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 piecing together some things where there are I mean now when you add this new information there there's a new way to read it and it's kind of similar but it's not quite the same and and the question I think will become as we move forward and especially if they ever do any more of these how does it continue to affect what the the original I think point of it all was um, I don't know that's the I just don't know right um, and it's i i didn't go back and listen to any of the commentaries or interviews or anything like that on the first films because one of the beauty of stories i think is that regardless of the original intent of the author uh, which also may their interpretation of their own work may change over time what i love about stories is we all bring our own baggage to it and we all get to interpret um, the author or the filmmaker's work in our own way, you know? So if, if aspect A is what speaks to us the most, then that's what we see the most in the film. But if aspect B is what really speaks to somebody else, then they may interpret it a little bit differently. And I love that about stories. Mm. Oh, well, and I mean, it's why we end up having podcasts and <laughs> shows and, you know, like recap things. I mean, it's it's we love kind of getting into the nitty gritty with story. You know, I just um, personally finished reading uh, The Cursed Child, uh, the the play that uh, J.K. Rowling was a part of with Harry Potter and, and, you know, how that that impacts the rest of the story and all. And, and people will ask that question and, and the story itself and all of that. And you just you get to debate and talk about what it meant to you and maybe somebody's opinion sways you you never know that's yeah so who knows alice's dulcet tones could be swaying (laughs) us right now (laughs) because for me one of the 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 key piece of the story that really spoke to me about the born which is a very common one for spies is that you know he wakes up and he doesn't remember who he is and he has that age-old question about well what if i'm a shitty person what if I'm a horrible, evil person? And as he learns more and his life unravels, he realizes, oh, crap, I think I kind of was a horrible, crappy person. Now what am I going to do with that information? And who am I going to choose to be now versus who it appears that I was previously? Um, to me, that was this really interesting thing about his character. Right. And I mean, can you change who you are? I mean, all of those questions really come into play and it's it's classic storytelling to ask those questions of a character. Um, you know, can you learn from the past uh, from your mistakes and make different decisions? And this movie does really ask that question. So, uh, I mean, uh, I think we can kind of get into that a little bit because we'll jump to the end of the movie here. Specifically, he is told you don't have to go and kill the guy who killed your father. You can choose not to be that person. You can choose to end it here and to walk away. And he chooses to be a part of what I like to call revenge destruction, where he legitimately helps tear up Las Vegas. And if the movie hadn't lost me before, it did here because... Born became a completely unlikable, unsympathetic character with the amount of people he was willing to sacrifice for his own revenge. Yeah, and they try and make it okay 
by making, I can't remember the character's name, the asset, by making the asset. Yeah, he's just called the asset. Yeah, yeah. the asset guy as being as, as horrible a individual as they could possibly make him with apparently having no remorse, blah, 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 whatever. So they try and give him a little bit, or at least they try and give the audience a way to give him a little bit of a pass. But I agree with you, it doesn't, it just went on too long. And by the end of it, he really is... You're, you're, I mean, those are the kind of things you want to show your kids and be like, okay, this is why revenge is not such an awesome thing <laughs> because this is what I it mean, turns you into. <laughs> you legitimately are riding down the strip there in Vegas and they're just plowing through cars and cars are flying everywhere. And I know Bourne can get out of a vehicle that has been destroyed up against the roof, the overhang of a casino. Nobody else does that. Everybody else dies. So, you know, I, I don't get all up on, like, say, superhero films for their destruction because that's kind of part of the genre. And yes, action movies have this kind of thing in their genre. But if we're trying to say a character like Jason Bourne can go somewhere, can be different, his choice here, I had so many problems with the end of this film and this revenge destruction. I mean, I, the way people hated the end of Man of Steel and what they thought was horrible, I thought this was pretty horrible because the message it was sending was, no, this was worth it. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, and that's what, when when they do, when a filmmaker or a storyteller is trying to make it okay for somebody to reap violent revenge, you know, revenge that ends in, you know, somebody else's death or horrible dismemberment or whatever it is, really nasty revenge, um, it's always a problem <laughs> because you, because they do have to figure out how to justify it, or at least to make the audience feel as if it was justified. And sure, they make attempts that you know the cars are going flying because it's the asset who's driving the SWAT van is the one who's doing most of the plowing. But Jason Bourne, in his, uh, and you don't get the sense that he's like, I need to stop this guy because he's going to take out more people in Las Vegas if I don't stop him. Like if they'd switched it to him feeling like, oh crap, I need to, I'm kind of what caused this problem. I need to take care of it or it's only going to get worse. You totally are left with the idea that he's only doing it for his own personal needs. So it just, it, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. It just feels kind of icky. <laughs> it feels kind of icky. Yeah, the moment that you turn something into a vendetta like this and you're chasing the asset is actively causing the destruction. I mean, the asset wouldn't be driving like this through anything and everything through casinos. I mean, he wouldn't be doing this if Jason Bourne wasn't trying to kill him and chasing him down, you know, the road in a charger. It just it wouldn't be happening you know he would drive away and try and get away and it wouldn't be violent so uh, I was really disappointed because I felt like they could have done it so much differently taken that 15 minutes of just wanton destruction and turned it into Jason Bourne tracking this guy down and showing how much better he is at what he does um, and then killing him almost silently you know like he just, that I think would be almost, and it's more heroic, that's for sure, because nobody's dying for it. So, yeah, the the character of Jason Bourne, I think, very much suffers throughout this movie of being a MacGuffin and not an actual character. I mean, he's just the thing people are chasing, the thing people are using, but there's no, what I realize about him, and I want to ask you, I don't think he has any character. He's just kind of a blank slate still after what four movies now he doesn't really seem to do anything or have characteristics that make him likable or anything he's just this walking amnesiac almost like even though he remembers stuff like there's nothing there i, I feel like in many ways that was i mean i don't know what was going on the in the writer's room but it was almost like well what are we gonna do here how 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 are we going to extend this story? And they they start him <laughs> Not out. Not always the best place to start from. <laughs> you know, they start him out in that classic gladiator kind of environment, right? Where he's, he's fighting other people, one, uh, 
according to Nikki's character anyway, you know, to um, take punishment for what he believes his past wrongs are and to probably to make money, um, which is a pretty dark place to be. So, you know, you get the sense that they're starting out this film from a place of the previous three films have just beaten him down, you know, from that lovely place where he ends film one with Franco Panetta and it all goes to shit after that, you know, and just continues to head downhill after that. Yeah. Five minutes into the second one, she's dead. Yep. (laughs) That's, you know, she got cooler really quickly there. Um, and I, you know, where does he go from there? You know, if you're going to tell, uh, as you're saying, a more heroic uh, tale, he's going to fight his way back to I choose humanity and I'm going to make the choice to become a uh, not a black ops killing machine, but to be uh, a human being who who cares about the world and wants to do good at it in a way that doesn't involve black ops. Because right, the whole other piece of the story is this question that's very current of privacy versus security. Um, you know, but it it's just not, they don't develop the story enough to get you there or to, to make you truly feel like anything's justified. I think the only interesting thing about the Bourne character is occasionally <laughs> his acting skills when he's, when, when you can see him struggling with coming to terms with the knowledge about what happens with his father, where he's almost falling down at his job of being the ultimate killing machine because he's so emotionally overtaken with this knowledge that he's learning about his, his father. But it's like too little. It's like just so not enough. Yeah. And, and what I would, I guess what I would have hoped that is if, you know, by this fourth film, he would begin to find some reassertment of other parts of his being, mm, mm-hmm. you know, like that, that he's cultivated something else about his life other than this guilt or, and I, I mean, I understand it. I, having been somebody who lived in like guilt and shame for a very long time and trying to find a way to let that go and to move on is very difficult. And when you're, who he is, that's very tough. But I think I, I need something else to latch on to this character again, especially with this fourth film, because really he's he's the same character he was in film one. Nothing's really changed. He's just learned more stuff about himself. But who he actually is as a character is exactly the same. A dude who's just trying to stay alive. And that's not as interesting after the fourth movie. And and he's he's a lot angrier. You know what I mean? Like in, yeah. the, in the first <laughs> film he's uh, he's he's trying to stay alive and do all that kind of stuff but he's he's innocent in a sense and now he's yeah, just yeah. he's just angry and miserable and jaded and blah. <laughs> he's just a badass mofo with a bad attitude you know, with a like, big old chip on his the, shoulder <laughs> exactly i mean the chip is huge um well you mentioned something that was uh, this is a, again it was something really interesting in the movie and and obviously paul greengrass is not going to shy away from being political and this film is very political at least it wants to be in the idea of security and privacy and that conversation and um so i wanted to ask you kind of what you thought about that because it's probably the most interesting aspect of the film and then the one that they just kind of conveniently forget once mayhem and destruction start and then they never really go back to it. Yeah, again, it's just another aspect of the story for me that's very surface tension. Um, you know, they they set it up, uh, as you say, in a very political way. We've got the um, Greek rioting going on. That's where the film starts. And as we go into it, we have all of the sort of this fun cyber stuff, you know, of them hacking into computers and planting malware and all of this kind of fun computer social stuff. media market. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> where they're 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 following everybody's social media in certain place to see what's going on. You know, all that kind of stuff is is kind of fun. And you know, from a spy genre perspective, you know, that's the kind of stuff I enjoy. Um, so then they sort of touch very loosely on this concept of what, what's it called? Deep, deep destiny, deep Deep dream, dream, deep dream, uh, as this, you know, I don't know, Facebook like company, Mm -hmm. uh, that's coming up, but apparently has done a dark deal with the CIA to get funding, which in, 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 I, I guess in relationship to 
people trying to hack into the the iPhone, right? That was with Apple where they wanted Apple to release the codes to be able to get into the phones. Yes, they need they they had a terrorist phone and the only way to get into it is Apple would know, I guess. Um, I don't remember all the details, but, but yes, something they, like that. Right? They had asked them yeah. to and so basically you, unlock the phone so they could get the details. So you get the sense that there there has something to do with the structure of how Deep Dream works that would aid the CIA in their nefarious plans for Iron Horse, Iron Fist, Iron something, something. Iron, Iron Fist, Fist. I think. <laughs> so apparently, it's a Marvel. I guess. Hero. So, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, you know, so again, they sort of like set all this up and uh, very surface, but then it doesn't really go anywhere. You don't ever get to learn what's the true about it, and you get this sense of the backstabbing because the second in command is also in cahoots with the CIA and ratting out his boss, and there's all this intrigue that's happening, but it never goes anywhere. And I don't know if that's because they're setting up for yet another film or what, but it it becomes kind of mm, mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. <laughs> um, what was so interesting about it is, is watching the film in in the way that they set it up. I, 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 I the biggest compliment that I can give to the movie is the production. And when they're in that riot in Greece, it looks exactly what you what we've seen on TV. Um, and it's it's freaky scary. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. When you when they show what the world is descending into in this film, it's well done. And I think the argument that they're making there is really interesting because they're almost showing in some ways why the CIA is being pushed mm-hmm. in the direction that they are. Um, this is what we're facing. This is what we're scared of. This is what we don't know how to deal with. And on top of that, we're dealing with a a group of decentralized people who are using the technology in ways that we don't even maybe understand yet and we're trying to play catch up. So, but we have no problems in hiring an asset who's just going to go around and just shoot everyone in his way. I mean, we don't have a problem with that. Even our own guys, we don't care. Yeah, that's easier to train somebody to do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess a, a hack um Deep Dream or Facebook or Twitter or <laughs> an Apple phone, it's tougher. Um but yeah, I, I think it, it's a really interesting thing because I will say that on this issue, they do a good job of not making Tommy Lee Jones's character as the director of the CIA just a mustache twirling villain. His reason for acting is altruistic. His reason for doing what he's doing is he wants to protect his country. Um, it's not so that it's the, the, I, I mean, I didn't take it. It's just that they get the CIA can have more power or anything like that. When he's having that conversation with the leader of Deep Dream, he's saying, you don't understand what we're dealing with. And the reason we're asking for your help is because you can help us make sure that other people are safe. Now, I'm not arguing that he's doing it the right, but what I'm saying is that the film does, I think, a good job of not just making them evil for evil's sake, they're kind of placing out there an interesting argument on all the sides that just doesn't pay off because, well, then we just want to blow stuff up. We want to, <laughs> and, you know, like, have a car chase assets, we'll and just kill everyone anyway. But exactly. You know, and, and, and so they set that up, but then, and it's a great theme that, and you're waiting for it to pay off somehow. And then it just doesn't pay off. And you're like, well, that stinks because that was the best part of the movie. Yeah. I, I guess the way for me that much of the, characters outside of Bourne anyway uh, are very much trust no one everyone has an agenda outside of what you think it is if not maybe three or four because everyone else in the film be it the director uh the woman who wants to take the director's job the director second in command the deep thought guy the deep thought guys um second in command the asset ev- Nikki even like everyone has some other motive than w- what they will state to the world that it is. Um, so for me, Tommy Lee Jones's character, even when he's presenting this argument, I did really get the sense that really he's only presenting that as the argument because it's going to get him what he wants, because he's playing the game, the spy game, uh, to 
you know, hold something over this young man who he knows about this guy's past um, to get what he wants out of him. So although he's not, you know, your classic, as you say, mustache twirling evil, uh, to me, it doesn't, hmm, it, it isn't clear enough. If that's what the message was supposed to be, it didn't do it clear enough for me to get to read that from it. No, and I completely understand what you're saying because I, I'm with you in the sense that I think what happens is that nobody's likable in this movie. Legitimately, no character is likable, even born. If you're honest with yourself, everybody's a villain. Except for Nikki. Um, it's just to a lesser degree. I like Nikki. Now, Nikki, <laughs> um, let's talk about Nikki because I also have some real problems with this. And, and you mentioned a term earlier that she was that somebody was coolered and or fridged yeah. and Nikki gets that treatment here. And I am so tired of his girls, uh, the people that he's close to females getting fridged. I think it is atrocious. And the fact that she gets it in this film, Matt Damon, his little liberal heart should be slapped <laughs> because it was, it, it's, it's unexcusable. It's unexcusable in this movie. There's no reason for her to die. It's, it's interesting to me because you know, the, the, you know, the concept behind that is that the, the women in the story are dying to put forth the male story. Now, it, it, I mean, it is Jason Bourne's story. It is his arc to have, or perhaps not have, <laughs> but it's, but it is his story. So all of the characters around him, in a sense, one way or the other, are really there to inform his path. Um, so I, it does bother me because when I did love Franca Panetta and I was very, very upset when she died. Uh, and I do, uh, I really grew to like Nikki's character and really liked her in the short beginning of the film that she's in it. It was very sad to see her go. That said, um, of course his dad dies too, right? And there are other characters in his field that aren't women who also die. Um, I think part of the problem is, is it's that romantic connection and that person has to die uh, but then we also have the two um, CIA operatives in the two other films just I'm not gonna remember what they are um, but who do have uh, very big Joan Allen yes exactly who do yeah, have Joan big Allen's prominent character. roles who don't die but they're just not romantically uh, connected to him so I, I I do dislike Frigine uh, but I, I am trying to hmm, try and view it in a less wow you're so much kinder about that than i was <laughs> i'm so shocked like i i, I walked out and legitimately i'm talking with my wife about that and kind of explaining because she, she didn't really know what fridging means right. and she doesn't read enough comics to know that and and i was just i was frustrated because this keeps happening to the people that he's close to and that's the one thing that would really allow this character to transcend to just being this ultimate killing machine would be somebody who starts to have a relationship and like understand love again and those kind of things and like I felt like they were maybe going to go there with Nikki and then they just take her out and it's not needed for the story to push him forward. Born is always already going to go forward. He's already going to go figure things out. That's why he's here with Nikki. So to have them be able to do that together I th thought would have been a much better thing because two Nikki's kind of become an unlikable character as well because she's working for this guy named Christian DeSalt who's a hacker and a whistleblower and, and leader of this group about privacy activists that, you know, not really a good guy either. Uh, and she's a part of all that and she's used that to be able to get these files. But you can tell that she's been part of a world that it just, like Bourne, it's not great and she continues to stay in it even though she doesn't have to. And it's like nobody's making decisions in these movies that I like want to get behind. Well, that are yeah, really I mean, I, I, can, I can totally it's see where you're coming tough. from. You know, the other way to look at though, that, though, is that she, she, from her own personal experience as a character, views what the CIA is doing because she's seen programs like Briar and uh, Treadstone and now Iron fist whatever it is iron balls let's make up iron something fist. Fun. <laughs> iron fist um and she i i could be projecting here but you know she wants to take them down she's tired of seeing them as these people who get to operate in the world without anyone 
uh, exposing them for the hypocrisy that she believes them to be. And so she is, from her perspective anyway, doing what she believes to be the heroic and the right thing. Whether you you agree with her approach or not, I believe that that's where she as a character is coming from. And in that sense, she does then sort of get a heroic end, right? She gets to die for her cause, <laughs> if you want to go there. I actually did think of the buddy movie thing, though, that I would have enjoyed, if they didn't become romantically involved, I would have enjoyed seeing the two of them throughout the film sort of solving the the problems together no i think i think you're right i think that's where it came down to the fact that the motivations for her character then are just so ill-defined throughout the they story as is enough, a yeah. lot of this yeah that you're just not getting it. and that's really just it's frustrating because i don't feel like that before I felt that in the Bourne films, especially the, that trilogy, I didn't really feel that characters were so ill-defined and their motivations were murky that I was just like wondering exactly why they're doing what they're doing and who they're doing it for and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, that's another, I think, just kind of failing of this film. And I, it's kind of frustrating because I, I think there are some good people in this movie. I have to say, I, I love Tommy Lee Jones as a new player. And I love uh, Alicia Vivikander. We both talked about her and A Man from Uncle. And, you know, she's wonderful. And she's going to be the new Laura Croft. I, I, I think she played the cold hearted person really well. The, the one who, like, I didn't totally realize that she was playing everyone until the very, very end. I thought that was nice. So I think both of them, to me, were nice additions to the movie. I just don't feel like their characters are like the best they could be. Yeah, I, and perhaps because I enjoyed her so much in Ex Machina and The Man from Uncle, I did not particularly enjoy her in this film. I would be hard pressed to say exactly why, but I didn't relate to her and find her as believable as the, God, she looks like she's 22. I know she's older than that, but she's the 22 (laughs) as the senior director of the 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 spy ops who's wrangling to be you know the director of the CIA at 23, um, I it, it was just harder for me to get behind the believability of her character. Did she play cold pretty well? Sure, um, hard hearted, sure, um, but it just it didn't sell me. I do love Tommy Lee Jones as well, but it, I thought the most interesting sort of new player, although his his role is so small but i thought he did wonderful and it is the the guy who plays the ceo of deep dream uh, ahmed or whoever that character is i actually of the bit uh, characters yeah, Riz ahmed. yeah he was he was my he favorite. was good yeah uh, and i think what you're saying is is somewhere where i came down as well is just that you know it it's just not well done sadly that's kind of what i think we both come down on you know, we have good people here that just are given kind of a mediocre story that I don't tend to really care about, um, you know. And and uh, problem is, is that we've created, and I, maybe this is just true. Maybe there are no real heroes in the real world, uh, but in the movies, I'd like to believe that there are. You know, um, you know, I still go to a James Bond movie and still think of him as the hero. Uh, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, and I think he's a character where, especially with the Craig films, they've taken and made a real person. Like, he has real feelings. He's had real experiences that has changed him. You know, they've shown how you can do that and still be kind of gritty and, and spiness. And this movie, I'm I'm, like, looking for that with Bourne, but he's not getting any of that. He's just... I'm still running around. Well, see, I find that fascinating because, of course, the first Daniel Craig film came out after the second Bourne film. So really, they were keen off of uh, the Bourne films sort of change in how action was shot, right? We're getting, we're not doing the nice choreographed fights anymore. We're doing more, you know, Krog Magov kind of stuff. And it's all very tight and fast and all of that kind of good stuff. But I find that fascinating because for me, you know, the difference is that Bond almost comes off as a superhero kind of character because it's so unrealistic. So if we're going to look at Bond, 
post Daniel Craig's Bond as more of a gritty character, then I have the same problems with him. He's a womanizer. Uh, all of his women, for the most part, get cooler. <laughs> um, you know, he's he he also rains destruction on the world for various sundry reasons, be they uh, motivated from Q or uh, for his own personal uh, revenge at the death of his girlfriend or whatever. You know, I run into the same problem. So I find it interesting that you clearly define them so differently. Yeah, I, I think part of that is that and maybe it's unfair, but it's part of the bond formula. I mean, it, it's been around for 50 years, so it's a little bit different. Um, so I don't expect it to play by all the same rules. And I guess I'm thinking through all of the Craig films, just specifically them. And I can't remember a destruction scene that puts this many lives in danger in any of the Craig films, um, that aren't specifically like attacking, uh, bond. Um, so like I'm thinking of Skyfall where they're at the house and the house blows up. That's a huge destructive scene, but they're all bad guys there. Not, n you know, nobody innocent is dying. Uh, Spectre, uh, the old MI6 building gets destroyed, but there's nobody in that building except for Bond and Leia Sadu's character, uh, Madeline Swan, and they're trying to get out. Um, so nobody's hurt there. Vesper's character has put herself in that position, you know, uh, to get killed. So it's, it's not quite the same. Uh, I think because um, she's a part of the machinations of the story that are going on. Like, um, the only character I can really think of that gets fridged is the one um, Strawberry Fields in uh, uh, Quantum of Solace, where she basically becomes the Goldfinger character, but she has oil poured all over her and dies. So, um, yes, that's definitely classic fridging for Bond, and it's not great. But yeah, the the rest of the films, I think, at least with Craig, have have one tried to be different and give legitimacy to storylines and to characters, but at the same time actually make Bond an actual character, mm. uh, somebody who has an art, so somebody who's growing. Who so they've brought in enough reality, but not so much that you are going to put real demands on yeah it. exactly because you know the born series i think has always been something that played itself as being more realistic oh, and, and not and yet yeah, obviously not in that kind of hyper real world that a bond film does um we even call it a bond film for a reason so yeah i think you just hit that on the head so yeah uh, and again that's something we could i just gosh you could probably talk all day about um and it's, it's interesting talking through the bond films on the show as we started at the beginning now, uh, John Champion and I have been talking about them. And, and it is interesting going back and seeing all those old tropes and things and where they come from and why and all that. And so as we get into the middle, it'll be really interesting. But anyway, I do want to say that I do very much have always appreciated these films for the technical aspects of the filming. Uh, they do an amazing, as you mentioned, the, the riot scenes are incredible, but just mm -hmm. the technical requirements of shooting uh not only the physical fight scenes and in all honestly i'm not a big car chase fan and the car chase at the end of the film really just goes on way too long for me i couldn't it did not retain my attention but the pure technical chops that it takes for the director and the crew and the actors to to put those scenes together to edit them the whole nine yards i really I think as I was getting bored with the scene itself, that's where my mind went to. It was like, oh my God, these things must be so hard to film. And oh my God. So I do give the film huge props for, for that. Um, if it failed in its storytelling, it sure made up for it in its sheer technical um, abilities. I, I think I, that point cannot be argued uh, in any other way, in but in the film's favor, right? I, the scene in Greece specifically with the riot, I think I was, I was talking to my wife on the way home. I was like, how complicated must it have been to film that scene? Because it legitimately feels real. Yeah. I mean, it feels like you are in the middle of a demonstration happening somewhere in Europe where no holds barred. Everything's, you know, I mean, it's just as awful as it's going to get. So you're absolutely 100% correct that, Technical aspects of this film are fantastic, which is wonderful. It's just kind of the story yeah. that leaves us maybe a little bit cold and as if we're floating in water. 
or we've been so we're the spy uh, that's been left in the cold. Exactly, <laughs> the spy who's been left in the cold. We've been fridged, <laughs> and uh, so that leads me to uh, what do you think that you'd end up rating this one, Alice? Yeah, I mean, I as I said at the beginning, I, I didn't hate my two hours and three minutes in the <laughs> the movie uh, theater. I, I did get a little bit bored of them, but for me, it was like a solid C, you know, action movie. It wasn't fantastic and wonderful in the way of character and plot development that I prefer. Uh, but there was definitely enough going on in the action and the, the, the beauty of how they put the film together that still made me perfectly happy to pay my matinee price. This one, I have to say, was probably, I think, to me, the most disappointing movie of the year so far that I've seen in the theater. And um, maybe it's, and it's probably because it, as a friend of mine, told me she said you know you did just rewatch the first three maybe that was your problem mm. so you'd set your expectations a little high but i feel like you know if you're going to make a new movie and a new in a series it should fit right along and i should feel like that it flows well and and it goes with everything and it, it feels like a worthy successor i would just say that i'm kind of reborn <laughs> i'm not reborn in this film um well, I think in a lot of the, you know, it's I, I checked Rotten Tomatoes before we started, and it's not doing. It made a, a a buttload of money over the weekend. I mean, I think it's more than sixty million. I think it was number one at the box office for its opening weekend. But the reviews from both uh, the critics and the fans are really hot and cold. I mean, I think it's running somewhere between fifty and sixty percent. So it's not. Um, it, 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 I think you're in line with what a lot of people are feeling in terms of uh, the film's performance of you know, people reaction. Well, and I'll be just dead honest this summer too. You know, I went and saw uh, legend of Tarzan, which if you look at the rotten tomato score is 35, a mere 35%, but I enjoyed it. So, I mean, I went to the movie, gave it a chance and I liked it. The same thing happened for me with Batman V Superman. So it, you know, it's just, uh, it was funny coming into this one. I felt like it felt too similar in the mm. end to all the other plots. And there wasn't enough to really differentiate it or make me feel like this needed any kind of sequel. And part of that probably has to do with what we talked about, where I feel like the wonderful trilogy that they had set up for the Jason Bourne character gets muddied now. Mm. You know, it'll never probably be the same. I only own the trilogy at home. I'll never own this film, so maybe it won't matter in the end. Maybe I can forget it. Uh, maybe I can get shot in the back and get amnesia. It could be um, Matrix. So I won't remember. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Somebody inception me, so I don't remember this one. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I'm right there with you. You know, you said C, and I'd say that this is about two and a half out of you know five shots in the back. You know, it's it just it's a very mediocre movie. It's it's so average, and that's frustrating because, like you said, technically the movie is made very well, and there's no issues for for that. It's just not as good as it should be. Yeah. And I went in with no expectations and gave it a solid C. And you went in watching all three films before uh, and gave it a C minus, essentially, or a D plus, depending on which way you want to yeah, paint that. Something like that. Dep <laughs> yeah, it depends on what school you're at, where they would place that. Uh, yeah. No, exactly. Um, and it's, it's frustrating because, yeah, I... I I liked this series enough to have owned the first three and enjoyed them, and I'll still watch them every once in a while. And so, yeah, to kind of come out of the theater and just be like, and I hate this word, but to to feel meh about it was frustrating. So, um, yeah, oh well, it's okay. Lesson learned, you know. Uh, you won't always love every movie, but I did give it a shot, and um, <laughs> apparently it just shot back, and... <laughs> <laughs> Not in a good way. So they, they they unleashed the asset on you, and that's right, that's <laughs> right. Uh, they did, but I I love getting to talk about uh, this stuff, and I really do uh, have to say how much I appreciate the people who make that possible through Patreon. Uh, we're a listener supported network here at uh, Trek FM, and there's just absolutely no way that we could put out the amount of content we do. In fact, Chris Jones, our executive producer and creator showed just how many downloads we had in the month of July alone, over 330,000 downloads. And that's a lot of terabytes, and it costs a lot of money. So we love putting 
it out there for you. We need your help to make sure that keeps coming to you. So go to patreon.com slash trekfm to see how you can be part of the team. Make sure that all the content keeps coming to you without having to try and find people to place ads in every five minutes or something like that. You know, we want to make sure you just get the best quality content without any annoyance. Um, so we just got great discussion and I'm really thankful for Ken Tripp and Davis Gration because they have chosen through Patreon to be associate producers of the 602 Club and it means the world to me that they believe in the show and that they want to support the network in that way. So join them, go to patreon.com slash trekfm and be part of the team today. Alice, when you're not running for your life from a terrible, terrible asset looking to uh, you know put it into you, where can we find you? Well, I tend to hide out over at uh, educatinggeeks.com. Uh, we are a much smaller uh, podcasting network, uh, and our thing that we like to do is invite uh, people like yourself who have never read Dune uh, to come over to our network and experience it for the first time, and then we ha- get some super fans together, and we all talk about the experience. We love coming over here to the 602 Club, and we love it when the Trek FM folks come over and play with us. Uh, so we hope you will do that also. Again, you can find us at educatinggeeks.com. And Alice, uh, is there any way that people can follow you personally, like say on Twitter, or are you anywhere there where they could talk to you about Born or anything else that's going on with Educating Geeks? Well, I mean, if they want to talk to Born, they should get on the Bib con- Conference because that's where that's we're going to be true. talking about Born. <laughs> uh, but if, if they want to uh, explore any of my other musings, uh, the easiest thing to do is to do a search on A L C B K R. Uh, which is my name without the vowels for the most part. Uh, and that's my handle pretty much everywhere on the internet. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad that we got a chance to sit down and talk about this. This is a lot of fun. Um, everybody, if you want to talk to me, uh, find me online at mrushing02 there on Twitter. Of course, you can also find me talking Deep Space Nine with Christopher Jones there on The Orb. And you can also find me talking the books and the comics of Star Trek with Dan and Bruce celebrating the 50th anniversary of Star Trek with some really cool book series. Of course, also uh, get a chance to interview the authors about their latest works a lot of the time. So, so much fun. Great place to dive into Trek there. And then I'm talking on another show about Star Wars with my good friend John Mills called Aggressive Negotiations. You can find that over at thenerdparty.com. And then, of course, uh, we're also on iTunes under Aggressive Negotiations. And You know, we just pick a fun topic each week out of the pantheon of of Star Wars itself. Um, Canon and non-canon, that's right. We like to shake things up, uh, and it's a lot of fun. So just check that show out. I know you'll love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And y'all come back now, you hear? It's always good in life for this. 